Hello Aluxers! This isn't your normal Sunday motivational video since we're not living in normal times. Before we start this video, we'd like to extend our best wishes to everyone in our community and their close friends and family. Please listen to the advice of professionals, stay inside, and don't forget to be human. For the first time in our lifetimes, we are all fighting the same enemy. We are all one and must work together to overcome this with minimal casualties. Welcome to Alux.com, the place where future billionaires come to get inspired. Our team is scattered around the world with a good percentage in Europe, which right now is overtaking China in the number of cases. We've been in quarantine for over three weeks as of making this video, which gave us a lot of time to think about the world, society, and where we go from here. This video represents a collection of the thoughts and ideas we've been thinking about during these troubling times. We already know that this video will probably not be monetized by YouTube, but we believe the perspective is still worth putting out there. So here it is. Part 1. The Value of the Internet Can you imagine having to go through this without the internet? Do you realize just how blessed we are from a technological perspective? How quickly the information is flowing? How fast we're getting real-time updates about the spread of the virus, as well as the vast library of content we have at our disposal, not only to keep ourselves sane, but also entertained and engaged? Take a moment and picture what your life would be like if at the end of this video, the internet went away for an undetermined period of time. Most of us wouldn't know what to do with our lives. Panic would ensue. People would riot. The internet is no longer a utility. It's a human right. But there was a time before this that we still remember vividly because it's the time we grew up in. There wasn't much to do inside. Even the books you had on shelves were pretty outdated and smelled a little funny. We spent most of our time watching TV, learning about the world through a carefully selected filter of what others deemed important enough to share with us. Imagine having to go through the coronavirus pandemic in the 80s or 90s. Everyone who's working from home today would have been fired. Companies would go bankrupt, resulting in complete mayhem. The internet solved all of that. Horrible things happened, things we never knew about, but times have changed. With the internet, information is free. We became creators and consumers. Today, we are the news. We build the tools that allow us to survive hardships. We are willing to stay at home because most of the things we love doing are inside our homes anyway. We have this library of almost infinite content at our fingertips, so we can push through a couple of weeks. The internet is by far one of the biggest technological breakthroughs the world has ever seen, and your ability to take advantage of this change will determine how happy and fulfilled your life will be. Part 2. International Cooperation is a Must we remember watching HBO's Chernobyl docuseries a couple of months ago and thinking just how a regime so scared of being publicly embarrassed is willing to sacrifice its population to save face, and even then, failing miserably with catastrophic casualties. We thought to ourselves, the world has learned from this and it's unlikely to happen again. But you see, human behavior didn't change that much in the time that's passed. China tried to sweep it under the rug because nothing this terrible could happen in the country that's trying to take over as number one superpower. It's only after the virus was out of control they pulled the alarm. Because of the economic relationships and trade wars going on all over the world, there's this lack of trust and cooperation on an international level. Both Europe and the US have failed to understand the magnitude of this problem and take proactive measures before it was too late. For the first time in recent history, the world is coming together against a common enemy. This is no longer an issue between one country versus another, no matter how strongly the US is trying to brand this as a Chinese virus. We're all working towards solving this big mess we find ourselves in. This isn't a me versus them issue, it's an us issue, which is why the world lost a lot of respect for the US when it tried to purchase for $1 billion a medical company in Germany that's working hard on a vaccine so the US would have exclusive rights. This type of thinking will only isolate you more and more and it's obvious nobody can survive this alone. In the future, this must become the standard approach to global threats like climate change, poverty, and disease control. 
countries should not act like panicked individuals and hoard resources when these are better deployed where they're needed most, with a general agreement that other countries would do the same for them. Part 3. This is a trial of mass online education. If you've been with us for a while, you know our stance on traditional education and that we're strong believers of the complete disruption of a system that's not only inefficient, but also enslaves people with debt. Online education is one of the next big stepping stones of humanity. Instead of having your view of the world molded by someone who's mediocre at best at what they're doing, the best of the best in the world could share their insights with the masses. You can have access to the highest quality of education that only the rich and a select few could have afforded in the past, for free or a fraction of the cost. The world has this tendency to democratize luxuries one by one, and we believe education is next. Does this mean a large portion of the teacher population will be left without a job? Yes, it does. In the same way that mail carriers have been replaced by email, that horses have been replaced by cars, and the same way that truck drivers will be replaced by self-driving trucks. The world is moving toward efficiency and widespread of quick access to whatever it needs, be it products, services, or in this case, education. We spend a full year developing our first course, Mind Mastery, and over a thousand people have taken this learning experience from the comfort of their own homes without meeting a teacher face to face. Right now, you can go to alux.com slash mindmastery and take our 21 day challenge. And by the end of the quarantine, you would have installed meditation as a new skill in your system. In order to give back to our community, use the promo code SUNDAY and we'll take $100 off your purchase. This unique situation we are going through right now has forced people to reconsider the way they acquire knowledge and figure out how to translate traditional education to online. It's not been 100% effective, but it definitely gets a passing grade. Think of it as the first trial of what will, within our generation, become the standard. Part 4. A large percentage of those working from home will not want to go back to the office. Education wasn't the only sector to be forced to reconsider things and find a viable alternative in the internet. As of last year, approximately 64.4% of the population is employed, with the average person in the US spending 26.1 minutes one way commuting to work. For someone working a traditional 9 to 5, those numbers add up to 4.35 hours a week and over 200 hours, nearly 9 days per year stuck in traffic. People are now realizing they can be as effective, if not more effective, working from home. This doesn't work for all industries, but in a large portion of the new age jobs which make up a bulk of the new jobs created in the past 20 years, it does. What we find interesting is for the first time in modern history, people are doing the math and understanding how ineffective the system is and how little value it puts on the individual's time, an asset each of us values over everything else. People are running the numbers of how much value they're wasting commuting to work, how much gas, energy, how much money this entire process is costing, and even the impact it's having on the planet. With everyone on lockdown, the quality of the air we breathe has reached the lowest pollution index we've seen in the past 50 years. Part 5. The government will collapse without the private sector, and the private sector will collapse without the government. Not many people realize this, but for a government to function, they heavily rely on the private sector to create economic value. The state alone is simply insufficient when it comes to holding up an economy, which has been proven again and again by history. The same thing happens with businesses in times of crisis. Because of the division between standalone businesses, industry after industry is falling like dominoes. When people have to stay at home, they get incredibly conservative. Money doesn't exchange hands and the entire economy comes to a halt. This is the main reason why you see the government bailing out these big companies. They're not doing it out of the kindness of their heart. They're just looking out for themselves in the long run. In times of crisis, the governments are turning to the private sector to keep us alive. For Amazon to keep delivering your stacks of toilet paper, for alcohol companies to shift to creating sanitizer, and industrial companies to build the tools our hospitals are lacking because of the poor funding they've received in the past few years. 
people are coming together like never before, raising money themselves to purchase masks, suits and ventilators for hospitals because they can't rely on the government to do it. On average, 40% of the value that a person creates goes to the government as taxes. The citizens want to see what's being done with that money, and in times like this, we get to look behind the curtain and see that most of it goes to paying the salaries of state employees, toward re-election campaigns, or to get squandered away through inefficient and corrupt programs. Every hospital out there is underfunded and lacking the tools they need to do their jobs properly. So the question, where did our money go, becomes more valid than ever. If it's not available when we actually need it, what's the point of all of this? The businesses that paid so much money in taxes are now struggling and are looking for financial support to get through these hard times. But the government is yet again slow to respond. And just to get this right, these companies are not asking for handouts. They're asking for a percentage of the money that they paid in taxes to come back to them because they need it to pay their employees and keep the economy going. If it comes down to the private sector having to save itself, why would they continue to pay the high level of taxes the government says are required when they can better deploy it themselves to help their business and their communities? Part 6 a hospital is more important than a church. We can feel a good portion of our audience's butts clenching up at the sound of that subtitle, but we're not going to shy away from this truth because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Every cultural breakthrough comes as a result of discomfort. Historically, faith and belief have been a major driver of the population. The value of religion comes from bringing people together and providing moral guidance in times of crisis. Although this has been true in the past, the crises we're dealing with right now is so estranged from the realm of religion that there is little to no positive coming out of churches. Even worse, they're one of the main hubs spreading the infection. For years, politicians have relied on the power of the church to sway votes their way, and in exchange, they provided them with a set of benefits, such as tax exemptions and pretty little oversight of their activities. As a rule of thumb, if your country has more churches than schools or hospitals, you need to check your priorities. The world we lived in has changed, and the issues we're dealing with have changed with it. No matter what your religious belief is, when you cross the road, you're still looking both ways. Why? Because God will not stop you from being hit by a bus. The issues we're dealing with right now is the bus coming at us, and this time, it's time to put your trust into what's keeping you out of harm's way. Romania, the Eastern European country, is a tragic example of this. A large portion of the country is highly religious. Political parties have leveraged this to stay in power. Over 20 hospitals were closed down in the past few years due to poor management because the people in charge of effectively running the hospitals were politically appointed. Meanwhile, the current government decided to spend 150 million euro toward building a mammoth church right in the center of its capital, while medics from all around the country were screaming they don't have enough resources to keep up with the day-to-day -day cases. Romania has just under 28,000 churches throughout the country. The number of schools, 7,000. The number of hospitals, 576. There are 50 times more churches than hospitals and four times the number of schools. A grim fact about the Balkans, in the midst of this full-blown pandemic, the church called for large gatherings and shared communion with the same spoon, pretty common in Orthodox countries like Romania or Serbia. 24 hours later, a good portion of the priests in the region confirmed positive for coronavirus, and so did their congregations. A large portion of the population has left the country because it lost trust in the government's ability to secure a bright future for them. Despite the obvious poor planning of the government, society has come together privately and through completely independent of the state efforts, they've successfully crowdfunded close to 30 million euro and built their own hospital for childcare. Romania is not alone. In the United States, there are currently 45,000 churches and only 6,000 hospitals. It might not be exactly like Romania's 50 times number, but it's still 7.5 times a multiple. And churches aren't cheap to run either, so maybe it's time society as a whole starts to think about the return we're getting from our dollar spent. Part 7. The Population Lost Trust in the Government 
We get it. This is a unique situation. Nobody expects you to know what to do in this case, as for many of us, this is the first and only pandemic we'll experience in our lifetimes. What the population expects from their governments is a sense of security, transparency, and direction. The big issue begins when pride gets involved, and nobody wants to look like they have no idea what they're doing, and as a result, people die. It happened in China before finally admitting that this is bigger than they are. It happened in the US when the president addressed the nation telling everyone there's no reason to worry since this is just a regular flu and definitely not a pandemic, only to have him one month later say he's always said this was a pandemic and how great their decisions are despite the obvious reality everyone is experiencing. Italy for weeks failed to take any measures because they thought there's no way this could happen to us. And the UK was arrogant enough to despite the threat and say they choose not to take any measures and let the population get infected as a way of riding out the storm, only to realize too late the scope of the issue and how many people are dying because their lack of action. By the way, Prince Charles, the next in line after the Queen, has been confirmed with coronavirus. Hospitals are screaming loud and clear that they need help. The private sector is in complete lockdown, not knowing how to support their employees without commercial activity. And the population is confused because of the way governments are communicating. Everyone is looking toward the leadership of the country for direction, only to hit a dead end. This corrodes the trust the population has for the people that were put in place specifically for this type of event. It's time for governments to earn their pay and they're failing us. This is why everyone is feeling the way you're feeling right now. Confused, a bit panicked, and kinda scared. People are afraid of what they don't understand. That's why you see people hoarding toilet paper, an item that has very little value in this situation. This crisis will pass, but the impact the decisions of the government have on the marketplace and the people who make up the state will be long-term. The world is finally seeing who they have put in charge. These days, the people should look at how other countries are dealing with this issue and make up their minds of what they require from their future leaders. For us, South Korea has been a success story in dealing with this pandemic. Quick to act, clear communication, and a long-term investment in the health of the population that has paid off massively in these times. Part 8. Widespread Surveillance is an Immediate Threat Threats like this one can provide an opportunity for population control. In order to get a bunch of people to agree to something that's not in their interest, you present them an even bigger threat and have your desired outcome as a solution. People will always trade human liberties in exchange for security. Here's how this example would work in our case. These types of pandemics could easily be stopped if everyone was being tracked by the government. Back in the times of communism, this was done through human informers, but there are limits to what humans can observe and the scale of their input. Today, we live surrounded by technology. Social surveillance is already a hot-button issue around the world. China is using facial recognition and tracking every single smartphone in the country to control the spread of the virus. What if, in order to better manage these types of pandemics, the government insists that for the safety of the population, everyone should wear a symptom tracking device, which will allow them to track for temperature, body humidity, coughs, and so on? If it was for your safety, what percentage of the population do you think would agree to this? You wouldn't think that many would say yes, but what if a state of emergency was instilled and the tracking device became mandatory? Would you say yes and save yourself and your family from both the pandemic and prison time? Or would humanity bond together and start a revolution? Our money is on the first option. It's easier for governments to infringe on human liberties when the greater good is an excuse. The issue is, pandemics go away, but these technologies rarely do. There's a great article in the Financial Times by one of our favorite writers, Yuval Noah Harari, that breaks down this issue specifically, which we'll link to in the description. We definitely recommend you read it if it's one of your concerns. Part 9. The Economic and Social Impact of Biowarfare for the first time in modern history, we're seeing just how quickly society can be brought to its knees, this time without swords, without guns, or nuclear missiles. As of making this video, it's hard to calculate the exact amount of economic loss that's being incurred right now because the number is quickly accelerating. 
Oxford Economics puts the loss of output alone at around $1.1 trillion. That's the amount of money we stopped generating since the pandemic went into full swing. Let's look at the U.S. for example. As of February 2018, the entire U.S. stock market was valued at $30.1 trillion. But in the past 45 days, the U.S. stock market lost 35% of its value, which is safe to say $10 trillion in losses. Quick to spread viruses have vast economic impacts. They destabilize economies, cause death, and put the world into chaos. This time, it happened to be an accident, hopefully. But every military in the world is getting a crash course on pandemics right now, opening a Pandora's box of new weaponry. How can we stop a country like North Korea from using any weapon at its disposal if it felt threatened? Who is going to oversee that a terrorist group isn't working on bio-warfare of its own? The first confirmed case was on December 1st in Wuhan, China. As of making this video, it's not even the end of March and the world is in a full pandemic mode. It took less than four months to go from a single individual to an international threat. Part 10. The rich are getting richer, faster than ever before. Ironically, it's in times like these when everybody is overprotecting and trying to secure the little they have that the rich come out to play. There are times when the rich get even richer and billionaires are taking full advantage of the drop in the marketplace. They're getting 30 to 50% discounts on stocks that are going to make them fortunes in the future. Not only do the rich have access to private testing, but their isolation needs are covered in order to make sure they are not infected. Many of you may not know this, but China has been taking full advantage of this crisis in order to take back ownership of Chinese company stocks. Companies in mainland China are under direct and indirect control by the state because most of them have secured the majority of their funding from the government, so there is an economic interest in how these companies perform. The moment the market crashed, China's biggest technology players began repurchasing their own stocks from international investors with the money the government has put at their disposal. JD.com, China's biggest e-commerce and technological player, has been purchasing stocks worth $2 billion every 24 hours. Despite the troubling times, JD is still valued at $67 billion in total. China is using the coronavirus to strengthen its technological and financial position. But they weren't the only ones to move. Warren Buffett was quick to act as well. Last year, the world tilted its head like a golden retriever, not understanding why Warren Buffett was sitting on $128 billion in cash and not taking full advantage of the market that seemed to be going over the moon. Well, now we know why. Yes, Berkshire Hathaway has lost almost $70 to $90 billion from the drop in the Dow Jones. But while the media was focused on how much money Warren was losing, he was quietly expanding his position acquiring stocks in almost every American airline company. His reasoning? Airlines are not flying. People are panicking. Stock market drops. He's buying. We overcome the coronavirus. Companies resume their usual activity. The real value of the service has not been damaged long term by the virus, so he's getting a big chunk into some of the best American companies for a fraction of the cost. Crypto is also an incredible opportunity, with the price dropping by almost 50% and immediately jumping back to 20%, which investors are looking to cash in at least 30% in earnings before the end of the year. 40% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, with this segment of the population unable to absorb an expense of $400 or more. Poor people are the most impacted by this epidemic. The rich will be okay, and the gap in between social classes will grow even further. Part 11. People do not understand how exponential growth works. One thing that caught our attention was the lack of understanding of numbers. From the general population to world leaders, we've heard numerous times things like, the flu kills 50,000 people every year, corona kills a couple of thousand. Car accidents kill much more people, but you don't see us banning cars. If you lack a basic education, both of these arguments might sound legit to you. 50,000 people dying from the flu is a greater number than the few thousand that died from this virus. Here's why you need to understand numbers, kids, and why you should pay attention in school. The number of people who die because of the flu is a linear number. 
the mortality rate for the flu is at 0.1%. If you get the flu, one in every 1,000 people will die. The mortality rate for the coronavirus is between 3 to 5% of the infected population right now. At 3%, it's 30 times deadlier than the flu. But those numbers don't stop there. You see, coronavirus has an additional dimension to the number of its victims, how easily it spreads. Without social distancing, without you staying at home, the virus spread is exponential. Why? Because one person can infect 5 to 10 to 100 or more people if left unchecked. This leads to an accelerated rate of infection. Left unchecked further, the entire world population could get this virus before the end of the year. Taking the United States as an example, the total population is 327 million people. At 100% infection rate, that translates to 10 million people dead. To put the numbers in perspective, 6 million people died in the Holocaust. 100% infected Europe results in 22.2 million people dead. If India were to be 100% infected, that's over 40 million people dead. This is why this virus isn't like the flu or car crashes. The death rate is considerably higher than almost everything else out there, and it's spreading quickly through the population. Fortunately for us all, we have ways of preventing the spread. Both governments and the population are making efforts to limit it. The biggest one is staying inside. If you're out there, you're at the risk of being contaminated and spreading the virus to more people. Washing your hands with soap and not touching your face are crucial to not putting the virus into your body and getting infected. Follow the advice medical professionals are offering because it could save millions of lives in a chain reaction. Part 12. How quickly the young are willing to sacrifice the old. This might be a different perspective than the one you're accustomed to, and it boils down to the level of empathy people are displaying right now. In numerous interviews, we've heard mainly the younger segment of the population say things like, it's not that serious, it only kills the old and the ill. Anything that kills is serious, and there's something that bothers us deeply about this perspective, how quickly we are to dismiss our elders and those going through illnesses as expendable. Would it be the same if your partner was fighting an illness right now? Are you ready to lose your parents? Are you willing to just let them die because chances are you have a better shot at survival? We know this isn't the case with everyone, but this underlying issue we've identified runs deeper than COVID. It's about human disconnect. It seems we've lost the notion of a community. Everyone is thinking in terms of me instead of we. This generational disconnect, boomers versus millennials and Gen Z, is in full swing in the middle of this pandemic. Through memes, the younger generation is calling COVID-19 the boomer remover or boomer doomer, and unknowingly the offended boomers are making it trend. How f is this? Everyone has people they care about. Everyone knows someone who's struggling with their health issues. And above everything, we had higher expectations of everyone coming together and doing their part. Part 13. Anti-vax, sorcery, televangelists, and healers, where are you now? It's all fun and games when society is doing well, when everything is working as it should, and we are so safe and secure we begin searching for problems where there aren't any. Then calamity strikes. All superficial bullshit gets wiped out immediately, exposing the world as it actually is. A scary place that needs knowledge, insight, and expertise to get us out of the difficult situation we find ourselves in. In times like these, the pretenders are quiet, while those who can truly solve problems go to work. Let's say you're an anti-vax person and your mother gets infected with the coronavirus, and by some miracle we get a vaccine that can cure the illness. You've tried your essential oils and burned some sage around her, but she's still not getting better. What's your call? Would you stick by your convictions, or would you save your mother and have her take the vaccine? The same goes for crystal huggers and healers. It's easy to play the part of a mystical being when your powers work in mysterious ways. But today, you have the opportunity to prove yourself. But why isn't anyone doing it? Because it's all bullshit. These are people who want to take advantage of desperate individuals. And speaking of taking advantage, there are a few things worse than multi-millionaire televangelists in the US. The exception, the priest from Romania we mentioned earlier. 
One of the most recent televangelists that came under fire in the U.S. is Jim Baker, who on his show sold a $125 silver solution, implying it was a coronavirus cure. It took the FDA a couple of days to shut him down. Another one of our favorites here on the channel is Kenneth Copeland, who we covered in detail on our video, Why God Wants Pastors to Have Private Jets, who healed viewers of the coronavirus through their televisions just a couple of nights ago with zero real life effect. In times of crisis, we're forced to return to core principles, to physics, to chemistry, to science that is true, no matter what your horoscope says. Part 14 how fragile our society is. Remember when we used to be in awe of just how much an impact snow could have on the logistics of transport? Every year the cleaning crews would be caught off guard by the snow in the middle of January and all traffic would come to a standstill until it was cleared out. Coronavirus was a million times that. It exposed so many flaws in our society, in our processes, in our systems, and in ourselves. The flaws are not new, yet we chose to deliberately ignore them or even legitimize them through policy. The problem of poverty among the masses is not something new. The lack of infrastructure isn't either, or the fact that essential personnel are paid minuscule amounts in order to push profit to the limit. Personnel that are now asked to give their lives to save as many people as possible. While some of us observe the phenomenon and have quarantined ourselves as recommended, there's still a large portion of the population thinking this actually isn't that serious, or that they're better than everyone else. For the love of the meme, we live in a society, a society that's already collapsing while we try to keep ourselves distracted with countless hours of entertainment. Our old are ill, our young are depressed, our governments are corrupt, and you're just sitting there pondering it all. But there is good in the world. There's good when we come together, just not in person right now. A society that brings people together is greater than the sum of all of the individuals. The old get better with medical help. The young feel better when they know they have someone to talk to. And you are an important piece of this puzzle. Without you, the image isn't right. The thing about exposing the fragilities of the world is they shine a light on what you have to fix. And some of it begins with you. Part 15. Who you really are as a person. We want you to take a good look at who you've been these past few days, how you behaved, what your thoughts were, what you did, what you said, and how you've been. Coronavirus has put a mirror in front of all of us in a unique scenario when we're alone. Some people hoarded hand sanitizer at the expense of everyone else, hoping to make a quick buck reselling it on eBay for 20 times the price. You felt smart, didn't you? Some people decided to ignore every call to action out there and act arrogantly. Others brushed it off as international conspiracies all coming down from the top, whatever that means. Who are you when no one is looking? Did you worry about your parents and grandparents? Do you have a plan to support them in these troubling times? Can you support yourself? The thing about tragedies of any kind is they force you to rethink your life and please do. Are you happy? Who is there for you and who are you there for? What do you want your life to be when all of this is over? We want you to take this opportunity and focus on yourself. Ask yourself the difficult questions you've been postponing. Face your reality and try to be better than you previously were. Although coronavirus says a lot about our society, about our leaders, about our countries, it says a great deal about ourselves as well. With the extra time you have on your hands, take the time to reevaluate some things and make sure to share your findings with others, which is why we're raising the following question. What did you learn from the coronavirus period? About both yourself and others. We can't wait to hear your input in the comments. And as a thank you for watching this almost documentary on the hot button issue at hand, we reserved a bit of insight for those of you still with us. We're about to enter the next financial crisis. No matter how loud the government yells they have it under control, the market will not be the same at the end of this. Not only did the Dow Jones drop the way it did, but almost every economy out there is entering a recession. The thing we have our eye on the most is interest rates and the ability to secure mortgages. People are scared. The economy is contracting. Everybody is looking to cash out. Nobody is buying because resources are more valuable than ever. 
Like a chain reaction from service to retail to finance to real estate, we're going to see the dominoes in full effect. A couple of weeks ago, we got on the phone with some of the biggest real estate players in Europe, and they all froze their operations for one reason. Not a single dollar gets spent for the next 6 to 12 months. Why? They're all patiently waiting for the recession to swing and drop property prices. Their analysts expect drops of almost 50% in the real estate market, so every dollar you have in your bank account right now is likely to be worth twice as much in real estate buying power by the beginning of next year. For those true Aluxers who are waiting as well, this is an opportunity to get your foot in the door in a market that maybe was previously unavailable to you. For everyone else holding large real estate portfolios, no worries, this is your time to expand even more because it's gonna be cheap. If you're a true Aluxer and believe this video has provided you with value, please write the word opportunity in the comments next to your answer. This crisis is an opportunity for us to grow personally, financially, and as a whole. Stay safe, Aluxers. Thank you for spending some time with us, Aluxers. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss another video. We also handpicked these videos, which we recommend you watch next. You can talk to us on all social medias or ask a question on our website, alux.com. Thank you for being an Aluxer, and we'll see you back tomorrow.